Voyager 2, following nine months later, was supposed to swing behind Saturn and keep going to Uranus and Neptune. On August 25, 1981, Voyager 2 disappeared behind Saturn, all according to plan. But something went wrong in the shadow of the planet. Voyager emerged blind. Instead of more beautiful pictures, the camera saw black. Frantic radio messages from Earth determined that Voyager's movable camera platform was jammed. At 3.30 in the morning, reporters were summoned to NASA's briefing room to hear the bad news. And a few minutes later, we saw that the spacecraft scan platform, this platform that uh, moves in azimuth and elevation, was not functioning properly. We've got very little data to work with. Engineers tried to devise a repair strategy, and after two days, they attempted to move the platform again, very slowly. Out in space, a stuck gear started turning. Flickering images of Saturn reappeared on the screen. Voyager 2 would continue toward Uranus and Neptune, a four and a half year journey. On Earth, NASA built bigger dishes on its radio telescopes to maintain communications as the distance to Voyager expanded by half a million miles a day. January 1986. Voyager 2 is finally approaching Uranus, a gas planet about four times as wide as the Earth. The camera platform has been checked repeatedly, and it seems to work. Voyager is as ready as it will ever be to investigate the planet that got knocked on its side. Let me use this orange to tell you about Uranus. Uh, Uranus is different from the other planets because it's tipped on its side. Earth spins more or less straight up and down, which means that the sunlight is more or less falling on the equator and less on the pole. But Uranus is spinning on its side which means that the sunlight is directly overhead at the pole and uh, is exclusively falling on this one hemisphere. Of course, uh, the year on Uranus is about 80 Earth years, and so uh, in about 20 years, the orientation will change and the sunlight will be more or less overhead on the equator. As Voyager approached, the spacecraft was facing one pole. The planet, with its moons and rings spread out around it, was like a spinning bullseye. But just four days before Voyager's swing past Uranus, the imaging system developed a new problem. Horizontal bars appeared over pictures of the approaching planet. Valuable information would be lost. What was wrong? When I got home from Disneyland, where I'd been with the grandkids, uh, my wife said somebody called and there was a problem on the spacecraft. So I came in about 10 o'clock. They had concluded pretty firmly that it wasn't a ground problem. In other words, ground software or ground communications. Engineers and programmers worked through the night. And finally, they found a single memory location that had failed, perhaps knocked out by a cosmic ray. They couldn't fix it, but they reprogrammed Voyager to detour information around the damage and clear pictures reappeared on the screens. Uranus looked disappointingly plain, with nowhere near the atmospheric turbulence seen on Jupiter or even Saturn. If the atmosphere was boring, the planet's magnetic field more than made up for it. Voyager found the field pointing in a completely different direction from the planet's poles. As the planet rotates, it is constantly twisting its magnetic field. Uranus has 10 very faint rings. Each one is only a few miles wide. Voyager found shepherd moons around only one of the rings. Either there were others too small to be seen, or the scientists still don't understand what keeps rings stable. Backlit by the sun, 
the planet's brightest ring had the look of a phonograph record, first seen at Saturn and still unexplained. But the biggest puzzle was why the whole Uranian system is spinning on its side. Voyager may have found a vital clue when it discovered spectacular landscapes on Miranda, a small moon about 300 miles across. Miranda's surface is covered in grooves. There's a V-shaped white feature about 100 miles long. And this image shows giant ice cliffs more than 10 miles high. shows a fault um, which has broken the crust on what looks like a scissors fault in which there's it's hinged back here and it breaks open like this and the relief on that fault is of the order of 20 kilometers what appears to have caused all this is that Miranda was completely destroyed by a massive impact and then reassembled from its original components Let's imagine this beaker represents a portion of Miranda, the whole satellite being a round feature like this, with the ice having risen to the top and the rocks having settled to the center when Miranda was warm enough at one time for this separation to take place. Now we know from a study of the satellite surfaces and a calculation of the rates of cratering at different places within the satellite system, that Miranda has probably been broken up perhaps a dozen times by very large impacts in the same time that the craters that we see on Oberon were formed. Now, if we imagine that the last time this happened, Miranda was smashed with a projectile, a comet nucleus, big enough to break the whole satellite apart, this nicely sorted arrangement of ice and rock would be distributed as debris that would go into orbit and would be mixed up in the orbit and spread out following the orbit of Miranda. Now that debris won't remain there very long. It will want to collect back again into a satellite. Rather quickly, as a matter of fact. But when it collects back in, the pieces that will fall into the satellite will come in different orders. Icy chunks, rocky chunks. Uh, and so when we finish up, the, the final satellite will then be all mixed up and scrambled, looking quite different than it did at the outset. So we end up with a satellite then will look something like this. Now, of course, the satellite is not very happy in that state. The rocks do want to get back to the middle, and the ice wants to get to the outside. But it has to get warm enough for that to happen. At first, after Miranda had been broken into pieces, the moon was spread out along its orbit as a swarm of boulders. Half of these were made of rock and half of ice. Gravity collected these boulders until a new moon was born. As the boulders crashed together, Miranda heated up, just barely hot enough to melt the ice and let most of the rocks sink through to the moon's core while the lighter ices rose to the surface. But the ice refroze so quickly, the surface was left rough with deep grooves and high cliffs, like molten lava that solidifies before it can spread out. This movie, which shows a flight over the surface of Miranda, was made from Voyager images and shows its rough, jumbled state. may also explain the whole of the Uranian system. Perhaps once Uranus and its moons orbited as the other planets do, but a giant comet knocked Uranus over.
The orbits of the moons were disrupted and they crashed into each other, creating a cloud of debris that settled into a ring of material orbiting above Uranus's new tipped over equator. This ring then condensed into a brand new collection of moons. Later, other comets may have passed through to smash these moons in turn. On the larger moons, gravity smoothed out the wrinkles and helped ice separate from rock, but Miranda is small enough to preserve the signs of destruction and reassembly. At every stop along its grand tour, Voyager had seen the results of titanic violence in the early solar system, but nowhere as vividly as here at Uranus. Where did these impacting bodies come from that pummeled the satellites of Uranus and probably tipped Uranus itself over on its side? To answer that question, we have to go back to the origin of the planets. And here we have a diagram showing the planetary regions we see it today with the orbit of Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, and the orbit of the Earth and the close planets and the Sun itself just in this tiny region in the center. And all of these dots in this region out here represent a swarm of small bodies of ice and rock out of which Uranus and Neptune accumulated. These bodies were perturbed by the growing planets as they were accumulated into the planets, most of the objects actually were thrown out of the solar system. And only about 5% fell onto the planets themselves. But the swarm of, of small bodies, which we call planetesimals, uh, continued to buzz around the planets in this region for about a half a billion years. And so long after the planets were formed, there was still an intense bombardment somewhat less than 10% remain today in a huge cloud surrounding the sun and as passing stars go through or near this cloud they perturb a few of them which fall down toward the sun to the neighborhood of the earth and we see them as comets. From Uranus, Voyager 2 sped on toward the last gas giant, Neptune, three more years of travel away from the sun.